Today on Locked On Canadians, the Montreal Canadiens beat the Philadelphia Flyers. Nick Suzuki has 69 points. Nice. Uh, and mailbag all coming up. You are Locked On Canadians, your daily podcast on the Montreal Canadiens. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hi everyone and welcome to episode 1040 of your first listen of the day every day as part of the Locked On Podcast Network and today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now new customers get $200 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That is $200 if your bet wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. My name is Laura Sab, also known as the Active Stick, and I'm joined as always by Scott Matla. And Scott, how many points does Nick Suzuki have? Ladies and gentlemen, uh, and those who, you know, identify as whatever is that Nick Suzuki, and this is a very important milestone. This is more important than anything else we have talked about this season. <laughs> yes, Slavkovsky has a record for the most points by a teenager in Canadian history, and he added to that tonight. And yes, Nick Suzuki set a new career high in points in the last game. And yes, and Nick, et cetera, et cetera. Nick Suzuki has 69 points, and that's the most important stat of this entire season until the draft lottery comes in, and then we worry about that. But for right now, let us all bask in the niceness of Nick Suzuki and his incredible season. And for the fact that his second goal of the night was wiped out on a high stick or else this entire bit uh, would be very stupid right now. So uh, it was fun. Tonight was fun. Everyone had a good time except for Flyers fans. But I think all the Habs fans for the most part had a pretty good time tonight. Um, yes. And I will say real quick. Uh, that is a very nice point total uh, from Nick Suzuki. In fact, it's so funny because Scott and I were checking the scores and being like, we're, are we sure he didn't get any other assists that we didn't know about? Um, just to make sure that we could stick with our uh, 69 point. Here's the thing. I do want to talk about it legitimately, though, officially or whatever, um, is that Nick Suzuki has, has hit his career high in points. Um, and there were some that, say or there are some that say that in order for him to be a legitimately elite player he needs to hit 80 points in a season and I don't know that that's necessarily true because I think he still has time and also his line mate Cole Caulfield needs a little bit more to get going in order for Nick Suzuki to hit those totals it's not just like he's not just a one-man player on the ice and that's the thing is, it's like everyone, uh, and I I apologize because I'm not 100% sure who mentioned this, but they were like, it is great that Slavkovsky is taking that next step and that Cole Caulfield is developing a more rounded game. He has 55 points on the season in 71 games played. It's not bad. No, those are fantastic numbers. We would love to see his goal scoring go back up. You know, 20 goals is 20 goals. He's at 20... Not counting the COVID-shortened season there in 2021, 23 goals, 26 goals in 46 games last year, where, remember, half the season was ruined thanks to Dominic Ducharme, and then he missed the rest of it. 20 goals, 35 assists this season. He's finding a lot of balance in the, in this season so far, which and is And it's fantastic. not nothing. It's not nothing. And that's exactly it, is that Caulfield can still – it would take – a really good goal st scoring streak to end the year to hit 30 goals. It's mm -hmm. not impossible. We've seen <laughs> him do it, but he's still shooting 7.4%. Which is way lower than his like shooting average. Uh, also, I think, I think Nick Suzuki, he just has to be a point per game now, right? To, to hit 80. Uh, I let's see. No, there are 10 games left after this. So he needs so just over a point per game to hit 80 points. Right. Which is not, unheard of like that's Nick Suzuki hitting 80 points this season would blow my mind uh right. because I really didn't think without Kirby Doc they'd be able to do it uh I I am so impressed and it's funny is that I want to talk about the goal he didn't score tonight because <laughs> 
comes in, puck comes up, it gets batted in front of Samuel Erson, and he hits it just, and I mean just barely above his shoulder, to knock it forward and then below the crossbar knocks it in. That if the goal had counted in any way, shape, or form, one, John Tortorella would have exploded on the spot, and two, Nick Suzuki would have scored a, scored a top five goal in Montreal Canadiens history with that. I don't think I'm saying that lightly, that if that goal, if he had managed to keep it down below his shoulders but before he deflected it in, would have been incredible. You know, we saw Sidney Crosby do it to the Canadians years ago. <laughs> and I'm not saying Nick Suzuki is Sidney Crosby, but my God, the talent to pull that off. This was a game that had so much out of nothing that we didn't know what to expect of it. Mm -hmm. And just got, it was fun. Even yeah. if they lost this game, I had fun watching this team play. Which you know what I'm not going to look at the numbers as I look at the numbers here, but, but they did like they didn't lose. That's the thing. Like even if they had lost, it was, it would have been entertaining. And I think part of it is because the shenanigans didn't go way off the rails, which is something that usually does happen in Flyers games. I mean, Garnet Hathaway clearly wanted to get the crap beat out of him by somebody tonight, considering <laughs> all he did after the first two periods was complain about things. The Habs played a good game. And then in the third period, played defensively while the Flyers turned it on. They were leading in almost all these categories at five on five. And you know what? Great. If if the only reason it tilted the other way is because you played defensively in the third period to hold your lead and try to keep that shutout streak going, I do not care at all. You played a really solid game here. Came away with a big win over a, a team that desperately needs to win to get to secure their playoff spot. And you did it with your backup goalie and coming off a road trip and all these other things. A really saw I like I'm I have no complaints about the Canadians game tonight. Like nothing at all. It was a very fun, enjoyable game. I'm just looking at the numbers here. They're not terrible. The you know, Caulfield and them kind of got beat up a little bit there, but they're playing tougher minutes, you know. Right. And one day there will be depth and they won't need to. And that's the thing. <laughs> like they won't need to do this. Like this is like, this is what they're pulling off in a less than ideal season. So I'm still going to draw positives from this game. And you know, once in a while you just need to enjoy a hockey game. Like there's really no fun in watching a game play, uh, watching a team play boring hockey or struggle just like, you know, consistently all season Shout out to our friends in the group chat. Um, <laughs> you know, you need some positive nights, even if you are in a rebuild, even if you do want that high draft pick, you need fun and excitement. And this was one of it. And and it comes on the heels of a win against Colorado where, you know, it was emotional. It was positive. Like the vibes right now are good. It's a three game winning streak. They right. beat the Kraken where they, you know, scored a ton of goals and then just kind of waited it out played an intense emotional game against Colorado and won that one right. returned home. Captain hits 30 goals on the season, hits 69 points, which is nice. much more important. Yes. The <laughs> breaks his goal scoring drought. Your Slavkovsky keeps his point streak going. Caden Primo almost had another shutout at the bell center. Got spoiled with 61 seconds left. I know like, it was which... so annoying. And then Mike Matheson hits 50 points on the season. Yol Armia, goal and an assist in this game. And yeah, two of them were, they were empty net related, but it's a game where if you're going to win, and we have talked about this a lot, and we talked about this in the last one, if you're going to win games in a season where you're still rebuilding, make those wins count. Have meaningful things here. And this isn't, and I'll do respect to guys like Colin White and Josh Anderson, except, well, maybe not Josh Anderson, but like if Colin White scored two goals in this game and it ended 4 1, we're looking at this and going, well, who the hell cares? It's Colin White scored two goals. Little things happening in this are important uh, overall. And I think that's just the best overall thing that you could hope for in this. And I'm looking at Tankathon right now. The Canadian spot didn't change at all after this game. Ottawa also won, Montreal won. They're still in sixth place. They're three points ahead of Arizona, 10 points ahead of Columbus. It looks very much like the Canadians are going to pick five through, I want to say, let's say eight, because Seattle is in there as well. Uh, remaining strength of schedule, the Canadians are down to seventh with the Rangers, Hurricanes on Saturday, Panthers, 
Leafs, Lightning. Their easy games left are Ottawa, the Islanders. Uh, this didn't take into account unless there's another Flyers game in there and two games against Detroit. Ten games left. Not easy, but top. F- let I'm going to say top seven is not out of the realm of possibility. And that also allows them a lot of flexibility for who they're looking to pick. All in all, I don't see anyone complaining about the tank when the team plays well, which is the biggest thing. Uh, Jared Book said it best. They might be the best bad team in the NHL. And that's like, you know, that's not terrible. It's it's not something to sneeze at. Um, in the meantime, we've got tons of stuff going on, including the Frozen Four. And we will have some updates on the Habs or the Habs prospects, I should say, in it in just a moment here on Locked On Canadians. But first, this episode is brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. What brings home the winning trophy is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. From superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it is easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusions apply. eBay Guaranteed Fit, only available to U.S. customers. All right, before we get into our Friday mailbag, and we do have one this week, um, we have been, you know, moving around our schedule this week a little bit. Uh, The Frozen Four is going on, and we have the NCAA Habs prospects that are in it. And Scott, you took a a look at what was going on, um, and we do have time to talk about it. I was going to say, I hope so. That's how we planned out the show. Uh, (laughs) At the time of recording this, there was still one prospect left, or I did it again. There are two prospects left playing in the Minnesota. Did Omaha you forget game. one of the Lukes? Yeah, I forgot Luke Middlestad again. Um, Rhett Pitlick and Luke Middlestad are playing against Omaha right now. It is tied 1-1 going into the third period uh, right now. Day started off with Sam Harris and Denver going into double overtime to beat UMass. Sam Harris had three shots, two penalty minutes, and no points. Uh, no one played in Cornell, Maine. And I guess the big thing we're going to talk about here, because this is what we do on this podcast, because we are, if nothing, truthers for this. Uh, Lane Hudson is absolutely that dude. He has that very derpy looking dog in him right now. He is five foot, whatever the doctor says at this point, and he's probably better than your best defensive prospect. And if that makes you sad, too bad, suck on it. I don't care. Uh, Boston wins 6-3 over RIT, which... One, I was, I said this on the show and I said this on Twitter. I was rooting for RIT. They are my hometown team. And I want Lane Hudson in a Montreal Canadiens jersey as soon as possible. Uh, to say that the tone was set by Hudson in this game is uh, underselling it. Because the first goal of the game was Lane Hudson toe-dragging an RIT Tiger so deep into the ice. They had to call out somebody to uncorkscrew them uh, as he opened the scoring uh, 11.56 into the game. He collected another assist on Sam Stevens' goal in the second period. He's that guy. I like. I don't know what else you can say. He plays so many minutes. He plays so well. He puts up points. And when the lights are brightest, Lane Hudson just puts up points. You know, what can you even say? We're running out of adjectives to describe Lane Hudson now. And I think that's probably a good thing. He is just so beyond words incredible right now scott what do you say to the clickbaiters who say that he's not going to amount to much in the nhl uh we heard the same thing about cole caulfield and how nick robertson or whomever was better than him and uh to that i say also you can redact it um because i've already said that once and i'm not going to push our uh editing limits on this podcast You don't know that he's going to do these things. Oh, he's small. What He could never possibly make it. Yes, because small people have never been successful in the NHL. Hey, who's the Montreal Canadiens coach right now? Can anyone tell me if he did anything 
uh, while he was playing in the NHL after being an undrafted, undersized free agent who played in the NCAA. I think he might have won a Stanley Cup or put up like a thousand points and gone into the Hall of Fame and a whole bunch of other crap. But please keep telling me about how players who are small and play with skill aren't going to make it in the NHL when bigger, slower physical players aren't able to keep up the way they did. If you want to be a physical player now, you got to be able to keep up with everybody else because otherwise you're Ryan Reeves and you're useless. <laughs> so just can't wait for the comment section on this one already. <laughs> uh, it's going to be great. Uh, by the way, the winner of the Minnesota Omaha game will meet Lane Hudson and Luke Tuck on Saturday at 6 30 PM. So that could mean an all Luke down between Luke Middlestat, Rhett Pitlick, Luke Tuck, and Lane Hudson in that game. Um, Denver will be playing, uh, I believe, Maine beat Cornell. I didn't, or Cornell beat Maine in there. And that kind of wrap, well, and Jacob Fowler plays tomorrow at 2 p.m. against Michigan Tech. Uh, it is Good Friday, so go watch a good hockey goalie. Um, save like Jesus or something. I don't know. There's there was an allegory or a metaphor in here. And I just kind of lost the thread on that uh, because I drove back and forth across the state of New York today. <laughs> uh, I've been talking for a while, Laura. I am so sorry. That's okay. The reason I brought up that Lane Hudson take was so that you would launch into a Matt Laurent. I'm not going to lie. Our listeners have missed one. We haven't had one in a little bit. Um, so what's, what's on tap next? You said... Uh, so Jacob Fowler plays tomorrow at 2 p.m. against Michigan Tech. Uh, if they win, they will play Sunday at 4 p.m. against the winner of Mich or Wisconsin and Quinnipiac. Uh, Boston has already advanced. They will definitely play Saturday at 6.30. Denver will play Cornell at 4 p.m. on Saturday as well. Basically, everything is clicking through very, very quickly here. They will decide dates. I'm looking at the NCAA website. It says TBD. Uh, for days, but I assume that's partially because travel. There are teams that are in Rhode Island, in Maryland Heights, Missouri, in Springfield, Mass, and in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, that they're going to have to get them to the XL Energy Center. And depending on how travel goes on that, uh, the last two rounds are in Minnesota, there, or in St. Paul, I should say, in the Twin Cities. Should be wrapped up relatively soon, I would imagine that. They won't play at the end of this week. And by the end of next week, I would say probably by Friday, I assume all this will be wrapped up and we will find out how soon Lane Hudson is going to be here. Uh, and I guess Luke Tuck and maybe Rhett Pitlick and maybe Luke Middlestat uh, and probably not Jacob Fowler because he's a freshman and same with Sam Harris. Uh, OHL playoffs are underway. I have not had a chance to dive into that yet just because the Habs were on and I only have so many screens that I can watch things on at <laughs> once. Um, going into Monday, we'll, we'll put together another small segment. We'll recap the game, do three up and three down. And we'll check in on uh, the prospect series there before we eventually have to start launching into uh, draft profile season, which we will start planning out uh, once the Habs stop being fun, which is not looking like it's going to be anytime soon. It'll be, yeah, I mean, there's only a couple of weeks left in the season, right? So um, we do have some NCAA questions in the mailbag, but what we're going to do is we're going to get an NCAA focused scout uh, to be on. Like we do have our trusted friends that we, that are our go-tos, um, but we're going to find a trusted NCAA person because there's a couple of NCAA related questions in the mailbag, particularly focused on uh, next year's draft or whether, you know, there's any free agents that are worth looking at. Um, before we move to our next segment, which will be the mailbag, I do have one mailbag question I wanted to bring up um, and it's from our good friend Claude S. David Reinbacher one goal in his first career AHL game. Scott what took him so long? Customs. <laughs> I I don't know what the I don't know how well because if he flew if he was going to play for Laval I assume he would fly into Trudeau he wouldn't fly into whatever the hell the other airport in Montreal is. Oh, it's Mirabelle. And I don't think like, I think it's just a cargo. Um, I almost slash. called it Billy Bishop. And I realized I'm like, no, that's, that's Toronto. Toronto. <laughs> yeah. that's downtown so Toronto. like, I mean, I know that getting to and from the airport in Montreal, thanks Trudeau or whatever. <laughs> I'm sorry. Let's, let's appeal to conservative Twitter here. Uh, that I, <laughs> that I don't know how long it would take him, but I'm going to blame customs in Montreal traffic for it. Yeah. Well, depending on, you know, um, how, you know, depending on traffic, uh, but it's, it's not too far. 
Uh, anyway, we are going to get into our other mailbag questions in just one moment here on Locked On Canadians. All right, everybody. Are you ready, Scott, to answer our mailbag questions for today? Yes. Uh, also, I have very fun confirmation of something because I, uh, for whatever reason, and this goes back to our, our first segment, but I just got a notification about it on Twitter is I, I tweeted that for whatever reason, when the Habs play the Flyers, Nick Suzuki's petty side comes out. <laughs> I got a reply that says, yep, if you know, you know. Not just from any person, from Nick Suzuki's dad. What? And, and now I have <laughs> many, many questions. Why does Nick Suzuki hate the Philadelphia Flyers so much? And this goes all the way back to him patting Carter Hart on the head, stealing his soul, and just every time they play – there is something that Nick just kind of has that extra little chip on his shoulder. And now that we have confirmation that there is clearly a reason why I want to know what it is. I will also if you know take... what it is. Tell us, we won't tell anyone. We won't post it on the podcast, but tell us what it is. I also want your insane theories. Get completely like Pepe Sylvia unhinged with it. And let me know what your theories are. Tweet us at LO underscore Canadians, lockdown Canadians at gmail.com. I want to know your insane theories because I live for that kind of stuff. You can also post it in the YouTube comments. Just don't use the YouTube comments as a personal vendetta, people. <laughs> I had to delete so much stuff. Like, that's not us. It's not us. Like, things that, like, problems you have with other people should not be hashed out in our YouTube comments. All right. Uh, but please send us mailbag questions and also your insane theories. All right. Real quick. Uh, Scott, we, uh, and you know, all the stuff you just said, LO underscore Canadians, lockdown Canadians at gmail.com, YouTube comments. That is also where you can leave all of your mailbag questions. Um, we've got our really, really good friend who we haven't heard from in a while, but Kevin S. I'm sure I'm giving online discourse too much value, but I think higher of Jake Evans than most. At his age and modest cap hit, isn't he a better 4C option going forward in this window than any prospect? I could absolutely be missing something, though. I think my big issue with Jake Evans is that he is a good fourth-line center, but he is pretty one-dimensional, and I think there's nothing wrong with that. I had this discussion in our Slack chat tonight, too, because I was thinking about it, and I'm watching him play a lot more this year in a bigger minutes, not just fourth-line center minutes, is that he could be a valuable wing piece on like a third line defensive minutes line that you have now a center and another center on there, especially if you clear out some of the respectfully dead weight from the front from the team here. And you put in a fourth line AHL guy, a maybe a prospect if you know, you want to depending on the minutes and the development plan there. He's someone that I think is, I'm not going to say is integral to getting through into the playoffs, but he is a very nice additional piece to have. He has some skill. He has some speed. He wins a lot of face-offs and he plays and he's used to playing defensive minutes. He's earned, you know, that role with the Montreal Canadians. I think he's someone that is, I don't want to say a luxury, but a really big benefit to have. I'm curious to see long-term what the fit is because he's very clearly kind of capped out where he is on this team. But I think he's a good piece to have in here that kind of keeps those cogs rolling as like a third line winger or your fourth line center, depending he's played a lot. He's played above his station so far this season. Uh, and I think they would be very willing to, you know, reward him for that. I agree. Um, but I like, there's just like, there's something about it where when we're talking about players like that, like there's a lot more of those than there would be a top six potential, right? So like top six potentials are harder to come by. Bottom six is usually a little bit easier to replace. But as I always say on this podcast, if you listen to any episode, I'm always like, there's such a thing as a better bottom six than a replaceable bottom six. So uh, we've got a question from Tristan T. What happens first? Colin White gets a point, Josh Anderson scores, or the heat death of the universe? Oh, boy. I, uh, 
I think Colin White's accidentally going to get a point like banking a puck in off Michael Pozzetta's butt or something in one of these <laughs> games. Like, I feel bad. It's not that he hasn't had chances. It's just that he is what he is, and it's a fourth-line player right now. Mm-hmm. He's going to get a point on something ridiculous. It'll happen. Um, I think Anderson will score. I don't want to say against Carolina because that would require the Canadians to touch the puck against Carolina, but I wouldn't be shocked if Josh Anderson scores against the Leafs in their next meeting. So we've got a question about the rebuild, and then we have another one from our good friend Charles W., but we're going to talk about that in a segment next week. We just Our schedule is a bit weird this week, so um, we didn't have a chance to have that Wednesday episode where we were planning to discuss this. But uh, Jeff the Red, in the meantime, does ask about the re- rebuild. What's your level of satisfaction in the rebuild near the end of this season compared to before the season? What are key next steps the team needs to do in the rebuild? So, sorry, do you want to answer and then I'll, I'll give no, my I'll let, go ahead, go ahead. <sighs> it's interesting because early in the season, I felt like they were treading water and this has nothing to do with the injuries. I just felt like I didn't see any leaps and bounds. And, and t- at the end of this season, I haven't seen other than Slavkovsky actual leaps or bounds. But if you look individually and you look at what each player is doing individually and what each player is, wait, did I say Nick Suzuki or Yuri Slavkovsky? I meant Yuri Yuri Slavkovsky. Yeah. Yeah. He's the one with the leaps and bounds. Nick Suzuki has taken a step, right? But like, if you looked at, if you look individually at games and performances over the course of the season, they're getting consistently better at smaller things. So at the end of the season, a lot of them, have taken a leap forward. It just wasn't in our face. They weren't in our face about it. It's like they they, they took the steps. It's just, it adds up to a leap is what I should say. So I feel a lot better in particular because their draft positioning still has the potential to be in the top 10. And in fact, the likelihood to be in the top 10, right? Would I like a top five as opposed to a top seven or a top eight? Yes, absolutely. Would I have loved the top three? Yes, 100%. But the fact that they're still picking in that top 10 And their younger players that are supposed to be the core have taken steps. And I'm not going to count Joshua as a, as a, uh, as a, as a, as a leap or bound or anything like that, because he came in threatening to make the NHL. And he, when he was in the NHL, he did the most. And this is like, you know, this is, this is like his first season. So it doesn't necessarily count it. Like it, it counts in terms of, prospect development but each individual player who was already on the NHL getting better as opposed to the whole team going from a bottom feeder to suddenly threatening for the playoffs like that that was maybe something what what people would have expected that's not what I expected but I also thought we were being stagnant now I don't think so anymore because it's been individual it's been micro and it all adds up to a significant step forward and I, I kind of look at this season and that like like you, when they lost Doc, they kind of lost their identity and didn't know where things were going. And then they put Slavkovsky on the top line and everything kind of started coming together. Joshua Wah came in and was a good fit. Yol Armia kind of found his game again there. Alex Newhook came back from the injury list and is kind of slowly getting acclimated, but is making an impact here. The young defense, Arbor Jack, I came back from Laval, you have Jaden Struble, who has now stepped up and become a regular everyday contributor. Jordan Harris, not a flashy player, but he is just doing, he and Struble were fantastic tonight that they're rotating these guys through and everyone is kind of stepping up and doing their part in there. Caden Primo has established himself as an NHL quality goaltender, which was a huge bonus for this season. Samuel Montembeau, definitely your anointed starter, your 1A goalie here. He is your starter. All the little things have come together at this and that, yeah, they're all coming together at a time when you want them to lose games. But again, like we talk about, if you're going to win, have the positive behind that captain career high in points and goals, Matheson over 50 points, et cetera. All these things are happening. I feel much better about the direction of the rebuild now than I would have maybe, let's say, two months ago, where they were kind of waffling in this, what are they? Are they are they building forward? When this team is clicking, you see it. They are fast. They are cycling. They are skillful. Yuri Slavkovsky taking that next step is such an incredible boon for this lineup because now you're not going, well, do we put him in the AHL and we got to find another top six winger? 
it allows you to plan much more outside of it. You have a top six winger in your Slavkovsky right now. You probably have another top six one in Joshua Wah. Okay, let's build the rest of the team up here now. I feel <laughs> much more confident and seeing the way that prospects like Owen Beck have taken a step, Adam Engstrom, David Reinbacher with the Rockets so far. You look at Lane Hudson, you look at some of the guys in the NCAA like a Jacob Fowler. It sets you a little bit more at ease to see pieces falling in the right places like you're playing Tetris and you're just waiting for that one final one you need to wipe out a bunch of things at once and take that next step forward. They are, I'm not going to say done with a rebuild because as uh local ri- local rivals have said, when you declare you're done with a rebuild, you better damn well be done with a rebuild <laughs> and not saying that to uh, garner attention. So I feel much better. I am very this off season again, crucial, but I feel much better going into this off season than maybe I did last the year beginning of the season and the beginning of this season here. Yes. Um, and then one final one from Jeff, the red, any objectives you'd like to see any individual Habs meet by the end of the season, Nick Suzuki, 80 points. Yeah. Nick Suzuki, 80 points. I would love to see if Slav could top 50, uh, Caulfield, 25 goals would be nice. Uh, if Josh Anderson could break double digit goals, I'm not saying it would be impressive be, considering he's beginning paid at what he is, but uh, it might feel good for him. I hope so. Uh, <laughs> I would like to see that. And then I just want to see Lane Hudson in a Habs Jersey, even if it's one game, I want to see it. And that's all for us for now. If you want to email us, you can at lockedoncanadians at gmail.com. Check us out on Twitter, LO underscore Canadians. Send us questions there too. Uh, Also the YouTube comments. Thank you so much for listening. And we will talk to you next time.